Looks like Chancellor King is having some technical issues. He'll be back uh, on the Zoom here momentarily to get us started. Uh, Mr. Ross. Gabe. Yes, we're waiting for the chancellors having some technical issues here. Uh, I think uh, Deputy Chancellor Nye is going to kick us off in Chancellor King's absence here. We'll pinch hit um, well, until the chancellor yeah. is able to get logged back in. Is there an issue with the uh, YouTube streaming? I have a, a the bane of being in the tech department. Um, somebody's saying they can't, nothing's coming up with the YouTube yet. I don't think so. I'll, I'll look at that right now while, uh, while uh, Jamie gets us started and uh, I'll report back if there's any issues. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for our, our Los Rios uh, budget overview and uh, Los Rios College's online update. Uh, we have a large number of folks uh, on this meeting and uh, we're going to get started with the budget overview and uh, I want to begin by first uh, thanking everyone here for taking time out to join us here and also for all the work you've been doing. Uh, it's uh, really an amazing accomplishment, the transition we made. And I know that many of you are uh, getting exhausted like I am from Zoom meetings and we all are. And so uh, I do appreciate your attention on this one. 
Uh, we're going to get started with Vice Chancellor Mario Rodriguez going over uh, the budget, and we're going to go into quite a bit of detail on this. We want folks to have a good overview of how the budget works, uh, what the recent announcement of major reductions in our state budget, the effects that that will likely have on Los Rios, and how we're planning uh, to incorporate those budget reductions into our fall schedule and beyond. So without further ado, I will let Mario Rodriguez get started. Great, thank you, uh, Deputy Chancellor Nye. So um, throughout this presentation, um, uh, feel free to insert your questions in the Q&A and we'll try to do the best we can of uh, getting those answered uh, as quickly as possible, in particular if they apply to a slide that we're currently on or that we previously went over. Um, so no need, no need to wait until the very end. Uh, so first I'll kind of start off a little bit of just the 30 dozen foot level of how our budget um, is built or is made. Um, so our budget uh, is a large budget. We're the second largest community college district in the state uh, at $486 million in the general fund uh, for the current year. Now the good and the bad with that is that 90% of that money um, comes from the state. And so the, how the state goes and how the state economics and revenue picture goes is a large factor in how Los Rios is funded and the rest of the community colleges in the state as well. Um, very small portion of that comes from federal and local sources. And of the money that's provided by the state, the lion's share of that comes from the student-centered funding formula or what is referred to as our apportionment side. And that's the funds that we get based on the number of full-time equivalent students served. Uh, the um, elements, there's elements in the, that contain um, how we do with those students in terms of producing outcomes. And then also the financial need of our students. The more Pell Grant students we have and the more uh, Promise Grant, the, the former Bog Schooler students uh, we serve, we get more money from that as well. Um, and then a, a significant portion also comes in the form of state and, uh, or um, grants and categorical programs as well. But 90% comes from the state and set, oh, nearly 70% comes in the form of the student center funding formula. So, the, so how the state goes from a revenue and economics perspective determines a lot of it and also how the adjustments to the student center funding formula come through is also a big, uh, implica has large implications for our district as well. So this is an interesting chart that tells us exactly what everyone on this call already knows. Um, things are very difficult right now uh, for, for all of us, really, the, the shelter in home or, or the stay at home order, the shelter in place orders, um, uh, while they might be inconvenient for us, for many Californians, they resulted in a, a very difficult, and our students as well, a very difficult situation in job losses. If you look here, this goes back nearly 30 years. Um, California, the nation has really never seen uh, a recession brought on as fastly nor as intensely as we've seen uh, in the past couple months. Retail job, our retail numbers came out today as well, um, not in time for this presentation, they just came out about an hour and a half ago. Um, and a very similar picture here, just steep declines um, in just about every economic factor uh, that the state uses as uh, a way to estimate how rep the revenue picture is going to be. And one thing that's important here to think about is, um, you know, we've off, if you've kept up on SACB or any of the other uh, news channels, a lot of the economics in the state is not just driven by the large multinational corporations that we kind of see on a day-to-day -day basis, but local businesses. And this, this stay at home and shelter in place order is just really creating difficulties. It's, it's not a one-time pause in economic activity. Businesses are closing. We've had institutions like restaurants like Biba in Sacramento that have been around for decades um, shuttering. And so the recovery, well, we would hope that it's gonna be quick once we find a vaccine, once we can get some level of herd immunity, we'll come back. But the underlying economics of this crisis are really driving a long-term uh, trajectory for a recovery that we might not see for a few years down the road. And so that's displayed on, this is from the Department of Finance's May revision. As you could see, for instance, in 1819, uh, the, from the big three, from a tax revenue perspective, the vast majority of tax revenues that come into the state that fund Proposition 98, which funds community colleges and schools, um, is dependent on these three primary sources of revenue. Personal income tax, that's what we all pay, uh, sales and use tax, 
um, and then corporation tax. You notice in California, we're a progressive, we have a progressive tax structure that's highly dependent on personal income tax. The highest of the income earners produce the largest amount of personal income. Um, and those are going to take a significant hit in the, in the coming years. We're already starting to see it now. And this chart only goes out to 23, 24. Um, but even in that year, we're only projected to get $128 billion of revenue, which is uh, about $11 billion less than we had in the prior year. So this is going to be a, a long-term recovery we're looking towards. Um, there's hopes that it will be much shorter, um, but um, based on what the Legislative Analyst Office, which is the legislature's economic and fiscal policy experts, and the Department of Finance, which is the estimate you're seeing right in front of you, um, this is going to be a long journey for us to get back to where we were. So because of the difficulty to um, everybody that's occurred because of the uh, shelter in place and stay at home orders, um, the federal government and the state government have both adjusted their tax collection deadlines to instead of the traditional April 15th, they've pushed them back to July 15th. And that's a very courteous thing for them to do because it allows people who have been um, displaced, who have had difficulty transitioning to the new world in which we're living in, a little bit more time to be able to comply with those uh, federal and state deadlines. The unfortunate thing that it has for people who are dependent on uh, the state budget, as we are as an organization, is that the state has really no good revenue estimates to work from at this point. So traditionally, the deadline to submit uh, taxes to both the state and the federal governments is April 15th. That is the, the May revision is released on mid-May. And the reason it's released in mid-May is because they use the information as of mid-April to be able to project what next year's taxes are going, our next year's tax revenues are going to look like. And you remember from the last chart, personal income tax is a huge portion of revenue that drives how the state does and how we ultimately do as community colleges and at Los Rios. And so with those deadlines being pushed back, there's really no great information uh, about how this year or next year is going to end up. And so um, the state still has a constitutional deadline that they must pass a budget, a balanced budget by July 1st, but they're really shooting in the dark here. Um, looking at historical trends, uh, it's way off pace. Um, so the numbers that they came out with, the numbers that you've seen on the chart before you, and, the, and then some of the, how those numbers will impact the community college system and us, we're all just a shot in the dark at this point. So what they're going to also do is they're gonna have, they're gonna pass a budget um, by the uh, end of the fiscal year in June 30th, but they're also going to do kind of like a second May revision, but in the August and September timeframe. So they're gonna wait for July 15th to pass, and then they're going to do another look at the rev. They're going to calculate the revenues. Um, that will probably take about a month. Then they're gonna, then they're going to come out with a new version of the budget sometime in uh, July August timeframe that will hopefully be approved by the August September timeframe, possibly October. Now the significance of that is because we're getting back to the place where we used to be, which is being a quarter of the way into the fiscal year and not knowing what our real revenue picture for that year is going to be like. And so we're just going to be upfront and ask for your flexibility. Um, we are going to, for the next year or two, we're gonna have a certain picture of how our fiscal um, health is and what we can do, uh, but we're not gonna have it complete. There's gonna be a lot of changing deadlines and timelines, things that we're used to having conversations about at a certain period we might not be able to get to. Um, so, uh, but we're, we're doing the best we can and adjusting as the state and the federal government are adjusting their timelines as well. So we did get a May revision released uh, on Thursday of last week, um, and it was devastating. Um, it was right on par, I think, in some ways to what we had hoped wouldn't happen, um, and it was even a little worse than that. Um, so it was based on this concept of triggers, and we've seen these triggers come out during the last uh, recession as well. Um, so this trigger, in the last recession, triggers were were based on if the state was going to pot pass uh, Prop 30 at the time, the um, Education Protection Accounts Program, uh, the, um, the tax, predominantly the tax on uh, millionaires. This one's based on if there's additional federal stimulus. The House on Friday passed the HEROES Act, um, 
but to be candid, the Senate and the president uh, have both kind of marked it dead on arrival. They've had no interest in taking up the bill. Um, now our hope is, is that um, with 50 states clamoring for additional resources as a way to get them through this period of time, that there will be action um, between governors of red and blue states advocating uh, their federal counterparts. But uh, as of now, it does not seem very likely uh, that the support for this bill would go anywhere past the House of Representatives. But we're hopeful and optimistic, and we will keep uh, the, the district informed along the way if things change. The student-centered funding formula, the, the rates portion, so it's essentially we get a rate per student, we get a rate for each outcome that we, that we achieve for the students, and we get a rate for the number of students that have financial need, uh, are all reduced by 10%. And so in the past, there's just been this theory of we have a hold harmless when this new funding formula came into the state uh, two years ago. Well, that hold harmless wasn't actually held, if you, could, if you will. Um, it was actually reduced by 10%. Um, and the difficult portion is, as of now, uh, we don't actually aren't able to reduce our workload in the same ways as we were in the past budgets. And so um, this would be, if we just kept it the way it is, the hold harmless amount reduced by 10% would be a $32 million reduction for Los Rios. And even a district um, our size, uh, $32 million um, is a big hit. Um, it's a very difficult thing for us to uh, balance and something that we, to the tune of something we haven't seen before at Los Rios. Um, the Student Equity and Achievement Program, a program that's funded a substantial portion of the support services and advancements we've been able to make in the recent years was reduced by 15%. That's a $2 million reduction for Los Rios. These are ongoing reductions as well. And the Strong Workforce Program uh, was cut by 50 or more. Uh, we're still trying to get final counts on that um, uh, for the statewide, which would result in a $4 million reduction for Los Rios. And obviously in each one of these programs, um, there's, there's people that are impacted by these programs and so the planning's really just gotten underway. Um, like I said, this was released Thursday. We're still trying to get uh, information from our chancellor's office, uh, the state chancellor's office from the Department of Finance. I've attended basically every webinar and every, and every meeting I can to get information and some of it's just trickling out. And then uh, uh, something we've seen from prior recessions, uh, substantial uh, deferrals that were put in place. Uh, so there's going to be a deferral this year uh, from the June of this year to July of, of this same year, but ne the next fiscal year. Uh, but next year is going to be even worse. It's going to basically, we're not going to get paid for the last quarter of a year. It's going to be late. And that's a $51 million hit to Los Rios. Now, in some ways you could look at that as just an accounting gimmick, but it's not, it's real money. Uh, to the extent we don't have resources that can get us through that, we'll have to go out and get a uh, temporary, uh, essentially a loan. Uh, a promise that w when we get money, we'll pay uh, some sort of bank. And so there's costs associated with all that. There's planning and workload that we'll have to deal with. But um, overall, um, even as well as I think we were prepared, and we'll go into that in a second, there's still a very shocking budget. So the good news is, is that um, Los, and at Los Rios, we're very strong. And when it comes to the position that we were in before this, and uh, the approaches and the immediacy and how we're taking um, this downturn very seriously and making sure that we're planning for all possible scenarios. So the first one is we have reserves. Um, now the reserves won't handle all those issues, but we're, it does allow us a little bit of time to smooth out the rigid bumps that are gonna be ahead of us. Um, so our reserves are in line with our board policy. Uh, we have all of really all the debt and liabilities that um, are associated with our general fund, we have taken care of. All, all of our vacation balances are paid. Our workers' comp fund is fully funded. Our, our, the, the promises we made to our retirees and the promises we made to our current employees who will be our retirees, that's fully funded as well. And so we're not fighting from a deficit as we go into this very difficult period of time. And by working with our employee groups, we've been able to implement a long-term plan for the um, pension rate increases we're seeing. We've talked before, um, and if you've seen the numbers on the employer side, uh, PERS and STRS are either doubling or tripling their rates over about a period of a decade. And early on, we made a commitment that we wanted to budget for that early, so that way we weren't in a 
position, which I think many people around the state are now that as those rates continue to increase, we have to, uh, we have to make up for prior deferrals of, of, of uh, not putting ongoing resources towards that, but then also the, the new increases that are going forward. And so we're in a very strong place when it comes to that too. Right when we, um, really after like a week or two after seeing the impact of the coronavirus, understanding what the shelter in place orders would do to our economy, we immediately started uh, preparing ourselves for uh, the difficult financial position we were in, where we were going to be in. And so we, uh, we stopped hiring. Uh, we were only approving critical hires. Uh, we planned, we began planning last month uh, for uh, different scenarios of reductions, 10 or five, 10 and 15% reductions. Um, and uh, we began, uh, my, my team had began uh, running scenarios for different, if the state would stop paying us this year, or the state would stop paying us next year to make sure that we were going to be able to be a fiscally solvent institution after all this. So we took the planning seriously and we started from a really good place. And our hope is, is that uh, we're going to continue with the tradition of, of, of taking care of our people, even in the most difficult times. And so for our next step and kind of to localize the conversation a little bit, each of the presidents is going to talk about um, a, a different point in how you handle these difficult financial times. So I'll hand it over to President Whitney Amamura. Thanks, Mario. Um, I've been around a long time. I started in 91. And so I think sometimes there's an assumption because in the past we had been able to grow above our allocation uh, from the state um, and, and capture some more apportionment and generate some more revenue. Um, in good times, that's possible. So there are some districts that don't meet their budget allocation from the state uh, and uh, they leave some money on the table. So the state chancellor was allowed to take those funds and redistribute it towards districts that do uh, have met their allocation and could grow a little bit more. Uh, with the state of the budget cuts and how deep they are, there will be no districts that are not meeting or be able to spend all of their allocation from the state. And so there is no ability for us to add FTE um, and capture some more revenue because simply there's no more revenue to be had. Uh, we are tied to Prop 98, uh, K-12 and us, uh, but it's a percentage of the total state revenue. So again, when the state revenue goes down, that means uh, all of our allocation in, in terms of serving students will go down too. So that's an unfortunate reality of our situation. And I'm gonna pass it on to Ed. Yes, um, good afternoon. I think the first point I wanna make, and I don't think there's any way that I could truly emphasize this enough, I think particularly given the period of time that we are in, it's the fact that we value all of our employees within Los Rios Community College District, um, regardless of status. So whether you're a student worker, full-time, um, part-time, um, we know that each of you have dedicated a tremendous amount of time, energy, and effort in serving our students. And so I just want to take a moment, which has been underscored by our chancellor many times, of how much we value you and we thank you for all of the service that you continue to provide uh, our, our students. And so I, I wanna definitely emphasize that first. Um, we are facing a, I think a very sobering uh, reality and you heard Vice Chancellor Rodriguez um, lay that out quite well. I think one of the things that um, is mentioned within the reality of budget cuts is the impact that is going the human toll or the human impact that the budget cuts are going to have. Um, the unfortunate reality is, the unfortunate reality is, is that we all are going to, in some way, feel um, the strain of the budget reduction. And also we have a realization that some in the organization are going to feel that in ways that others um, may not. And I think that is often unsettling for all of us, especially given the fact that many of us find ourselves in this profession because of our love, our care, and our compassion uh, for people. 
And so that is a difficult reality that we are all facing. Um, with that said, we know that given this harsh reality and the fact that we are in unprecedented budget times, especially in light of the significant reductions that Vice Chancellor Rodriguez just outlined. And we also know from precedent that when we look at significant cuts in budget, that means there's going to be a reduction in services and a reduction in courses that is going to have a direct impact on our part-time faculty, our temporary classified professionals, and our student workers. And we know this is outlined within Title V and with the negotiated contracts within our collective bargaining agreements really outlines our approach to how we can make budget cuts and deal with the unfortunate reality that there would have to be some workforce um, reduction. Um, but please know that this is not lost on us as a district and that we would do whatever we can to minimize and mitigate the impact that this is going to have on a significant portion of our workforce. And with that, I will pass it on to President Michael Gutierrez. Thank you, Dr. Bush. So far, we've had several conversations on really difficult topics. I get the opportunity to give out some good news and have the opportunity to talk about the CARES Act because it's designed to give emergency aid to students disrupted by COVID-19. And it's undoubtedly helpful, but it doesn't necessarily begin to address the shortfall caused by the pandemic for our students and for the colleges. In total, the colleges are receiving about $26 million, of which half of the amount has to be spent directly for our students. The other half will help cover costs incurred by the colleges based on the pandemic or due to the pandemic. So what does this all mean? Let's first focus on the $13 million in direct aid to benefit students. When the CARES Act was passed, about three weeks later, the US Department of Education issued guidance that only students eligible for federal student aid programs can qualify for the grants. And that makes it really restrictive in how we can distribute the money. In Los Rios, we decided to distribute the funds in two phases. And the reason why two phases is we didn't want to spend all the money up front because it's supposed to last an entire year. And phase one actually has already taken place. On Friday, May 8th, $6.5 million of funding was sent to students with identified needs based on FAFSA. The emergency grants were tiered based on the number of units the students enrolled in before the disruption. So the more courses they took, the more money they received. And the range was between 100 and $400. In total, over 21,000 FAFSA students were given CARES Act funding in Los Rios. Another 500 students were given aid from repurposed California Promise Grant funding to support undocumented and DACA students. And that's phase one. Phase two will begin in the fall semester where we, be, we will begin distributing the remaining six and a half million dollars. So that's the $13 million focused on direct student aid. The other $13 million of the CARES Act will be used by the colleges to once again, pay for expenses incurred due to COVID-19. And while this is helpful to pay for these expenses, we need to understand that they are one-time funds and thus really cannot be used for ongoing expenses. Guaranteed, we will work together to spend that half of the CARES Act dollars in a strategic and impactful way. Now, I'll hand it over to President Green at American River College. Thank you, President Gutierrez, and good afternoon. Um, so as Vice Chancellor Rodriguez has clearly described, our budget realities have rapidly changed and there's a new sense of urgency to utilize our resources as effectively as possible, including our finances, our facilities, our technology, and our human resources, or our people, in order to mitigate the impact to our students from this crisis and stay true to our shared mission. For example, we know that our students are in need of even more support due to the pandemic in terms of finances, physical and mental health support, food and housing support, et cetera. Additionally, investments in technology and professional development will be necessary to ensure we are equipped to provide students with a high quality, 
personal experience. Facility reconfiguration, safety measures, operational retooling, and other factors will all necessitate changes from past practice. And importantly, we need to recognize that the roles or duties of many of our most valuable resources, our people, have changed dramatically overnight that circumstances have overwhelmed and stretched some to their limits, while at the same time has made it challenging for others to contribute fully in their current roles. Additionally, in adapting to this crisis, we've also learned a great deal and rapidly changed how we work. It's been amazing to see how quickly the impossible has become plausible. And as a consequence, the budget constraints we're contending with must prompt reinvention rather than our simply reducing the existing budgets that were based on a status quo that is no longer completely relevant. And I don't know exactly what this reimagining might look like. At its best though, it's going to involve our creating a more agile organization that can readily adapt to any circumstance while also ensuring that all students and employees have what they need to effectively learn and work. It's going to require that we suspend the binary thinking of our campuses being open and closed, on ground or online, et cetera, and that we challenge the assumptions about how we approach our work and our traditional roles and responsibilities which will lead in some cases to the reassignment of people to roles that allow them to fully contribute. Now, importantly, it's also gonna require much greater levels of collaboration and compromise across our four colleges than ever before. And a willingness to embrace the ambiguity of all of today's uncertainty, recognizing that it serves as a catalyst for redesigning our future in a way that preserves and furthers our shared mission and our commitment to social justice and equity. Mario? Great. Mario, before we get to questions, this is Brian King and my internet is back up. So I apologize to be a little late to our conversation today, but uh, really want to celebrate what a great group of leaders we have working together on these incredibly difficult problems. And uh, you've seen uh, Mario, our vice chancellor and our college presidents. All of you know, we have a tremendous group of leaders across our colleges, including our labor groups, our Senate presidents, our classified Senate presidents, and in addition to those who are elected or selected to leadership positions, all of you on this call today have played an important leadership role in addressing these incredibly tough challenges as has our elected board of trustees. So we're incredibly fortunate to have such a talented group of people working together in these tough times. And this is the first time we've been able to have more of an interactive exploration of these tough issues as you know, for the last couple of months, a lot of our communication has been through regular emails from me and the college presidents. And uh, those sort of communications are important and they'll continue. But it's also really important to recognize we don't have answers to all the questions. And the pace of change recently has been unprecedented. So no matter how hard we try, we won't always have a perfect way to share information with you. But we're always going to try, uh, we're going to strive very hard to tell the truth. And as you've heard from the, the members of the panel so far, some of the truths are uncomfortable. And we know that uh, people are involved in these very difficult decisions. And uh, we wanna do everything we can to mitigate the damage to people as President Bush was sharing, recognizing that if the level of cuts that are required by Governor Newsom's budget come to fruition, there really are no easy answers. So with that sort of background, Mario, I wanna share some of the questions that have come in through the Q&A so far, and uh, for uh, Vice Chancellor Rodriguez and our other panelists to jump in as appropriate. Uh, Mario, the first question that the governor talked about, a 10% across the board pay cut for state employees. Can, can you explain what the options are for Los Rios in addressing these level of, of, uh, of budget reductions in terms of compensation? That's right, and so um, the state, uh, the governor, just like us, um, he can suggest things in his budget, uh, but just like us, he is going to need to and would be wise to work with uh, the employee units uh, to implement those reductions. And so for us, that's what we would do. The wonderful thing about the bucket system is that it's just not me or Brian or anyone that's a panelist on this call making all those decisions in a vacuum. It's uh, the people that are um, heads of the employee groups working with um, their members and us to ensure that the revenues ultimately line up with the expenses for each of the units buckets, but that we're doing it in a way that uh, minimizes impact to our employees and ultimately, and most importantly, our students. And so while there are plenty of options on the table, 
you know, the, op the list of options is long, is, is not that long, really. It's, it's the same options that are available to any other local government. There's furloughs, there's layoffs, there's um, um, early retirement incentives, and all those things could uh, be on the table, depending on how, how the numbers continue to shake out. Uh, but at this point, there's been no uh, decision or requirement that we implement the same kind of level of reductions that um, you're seeing the governor begin to discuss at the statewide level. Mario, we have a great group of labor presidents and, and wonderful relationships for many years with our labor partners. Can you help share how those conversations will happen? And by way of background, uh, part of the annual, the, the, the cadence of communication, not annually, but weekly, is a meeting that I have had with all four of our, our union presidents district wide. So the lines of communication are very open. The meeting that I have with our presidents is absolutely not about negotiated items, but just information sharing and keeping everybody abreast of the challenges we face together. Can you talk a little bit about how those conversations will happen with our bargaining units that, that have to do with uh, compensation and staffing and uh, the, the tough options that we have in reducing uh, our budget when it comes to that? Yeah, that's right. So the first option or the first step in that process is what me and my staff are working on right now. It's we just got numbers from the state. We're, we're trying to you know, analyze and calculate those numbers and figure out how much will be assigned uh, or what will be the impact to each of the different units. Um, and from there, once we start getting a sense of what those numbers are going to look like after we get more clarification from the state, uh, to be candid, but maybe we've had a lot of murky math that, is that we're still trying to work through. Um, then we'll begin to uh, work with each of the units and we'll go to them. Uh, we have a bunch of spreadsheets. We sit down and walk them through and tell them exactly why the calculation came out the way it is. They ask us a lot of really good questions. Uh, the nice thing about the units uh, leadership that we have today is this, for the vast majority of them, this is not their first rodeo when it comes to downturns. And so they're used to these difficult conversations as unpleasant as they, as they may be. And then so th then we'll begin to talk about options. Um, and it's really, it's much more intense and the, the options are much more difficult to deal with, but we have a lot of practice. Uh, every year we talk about what uh, ongoing uh, adjustments are going to be to the salary schedule. We talk about what a retro payment's going to be. We talk about how much uh, we're going to be able to pick up of the district's contribution to employee benefits. And so it's nothing new. Um, the, the numbers are um, less than ideal this time around uh, and a lot more difficult to swallow, but those, you know, there's not, um, you know, this is my third year in the district now, and one thing I really love about this job is that I really get to work with the employee groups act as, as kind of like as their financial advisor. We work together as opposed to me telling them what to do. It's really a collaborative process that uh, we lean on them. They lean on me for my input on, on the state budget process and how the bucket works, and I lean on them to, tell, to help work out a solution that's in the best interest of their employee group and our students. And as you would expect, Mario, there are several questions that have to do with salaries and uh, the postponing of negotiations. So I think the broad question is for units who are hoping for a salary increase, what impact do the current budget circumstances have on that facet of negotiations with our collective bargaining units? Just to clarify, Brian, you're saying what, what does sal the salary discussion have an impact? Right. The, the concern of some uh, understandable concern of people hoping that salaries were going to be increased during the negotiations. What are the likely impact of postponing the, uh, negotiations on salaries? Yeah. So, you know, to be candid, it's um, the numbers we're seeing right now are substantially less uh, than um, we had uh, w that we were thinking uh, when we had discussions with all of our units in, in um, February. Um, even though we knew the coronavirus would be spreading, I guess um, no one knew that it was going to be as bad as it's gotten all over America and then really all over uh, the world. And so, you know, I, I don't like to get out ahead, but uh, it seems to me it would be very difficult to assume that there would be an ongoing increase, uh, you know, uh, or even a one-time increase for that matter. Um, and so uh, we're really right now, every government and really every employer in the nation, um, and particularly in states that are 
uh, hit, as, hit as bad as California has been hit from the, um, not necessarily the virus, we've done a good job of protecting public health, but that public health protection has come at a cost. Um, and so um, it, it's just very unlikely, there's not too many employers in, the, in California that are talking about pay increases at this moment. It's really about making sure that we're protecting um, our employees and our biz and our operations as much as possible. And so um, uh, it just would seem like it would be very difficult to have that conversation or that expectation going forward, but um, we're still working through the process. I'm trying to go through the Q and A and summarize questions that are asked more than once to, as well as I can with the understanding we may not be able to answer all the questions during the time we have in the next several minutes, but we will keep track of all of the chat questions and address them in frequently asked questions and other communications. So one question is about early retirement incentives. Can you talk a little bit about how an early retirement incentive works, what that means and what the process would be uh, in determining whether to offer early retirement incentive? Yeah, so the early retirement incentive um, is, it's a kind of a deal struck between the employer and an employee in which the employer agrees to pay a certain percentage of the employer, uh, the employee's um, salary. So generally between 50 to 90%, uh, the employee, it goes out to a broad group of employee, employees. Um, and some employees who might not otherwise retire might say, yeah, I want to, I want to go. And they get a one-time payment, um, which could be annuitized or it could be paid out um, you know, in, in one year, three year, five years, um, or have a, a longer term annuity. Um, and the, the, what the employer gets is they get salary savings from that position. Uh, they, you know, generally, if, even if they were going to hire someone, they might hire someone that's um, coming in uh, at a lower step. For instance, if you take, if it's a faculty member and they're at a, you know, 20 years or, you know, pick your year, and then you hire someone that comes in at range three, their savings there. Um, those conversations, um, you know, we're, we're, like I said earlier, we're kind of keeping all options on the table. Um, we're just working through the numbers right now. Um, we've had some actuarials come out and give us looks at what that would look like. Um, but just been kind of, uh, the, the, our, my team's effort in the last couple of days has been primarily working through the, um, what the May revise is going to do to our district and on our, just on our units buckets. Um, but that's kind of how uh, early retirement incentives are SERPs, what they're traditionally called work. Frequently, the conversation has been everything is on the table, and that's part of everything, an exploration of uh, potential early retirement incentives with no proposal or, or no formal discussion so far. Correct. So Mario, we'll stick with you. Another question at the college level, uh, individuals working on budget cuts see what's going on. Can you explain how the same principles apply across the district as far as budget reductions? Yeah, and so, um, you know, the same, the same rules have applied when we're talking about our initial steps was to just to stop, uh, definitely stop as much as possible permanent hiring and only approving limited interim hirings uh, to meet critical needs that are critical at a, for periods of time. Um, that's happened at the colleges and across the district. Um, the same, budget reduction strategies that we've been planning for, or at least uh, take, giving serious thought to the, the five, 10 and 15% targets have been done at each of the colleges and across the districts. Ultimately what comes next is um, taking those numbers, pushing them through the bucket system, uh, the bucket formula. And then um, after that, we'll get a better sense of what we need to operationalize from some of those initial plans or which at least which starts or how to start those conversations going forward. Um, but the, the district office and all of its units, the colleges and each of the units at the colleges are going through that very similar exercise. And President Yamamura did a good job explaining what can be counterintuitive, that even though demand may be up in the fall and we see tremendous summer demand, more students does not translate into more funding from the state. And the unfortunate truth is that usually when the economic times are tough, enrollment increases and uh, resources from the state decrease. And I know Deputy Chancellor Nye is on the line and Jamie, I was hoping that you would uh, help explain a little bit the planning for the fall and why the course schedule is smaller in anticipation of fewer resources from the state. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I know a lot of folks are wondering about that. If you take a look at summer, just to put things in context, we were trending actually about 50% higher in terms of enrollment at about six weeks out. We're about three weeks out from start. And so comparing last summer compared to uh, this summer, we are now about 25%. But where we're going to end is really about apples to apples even because we didn't put out a lot more FTE. We kept the schedule pretty full in the summer. We didn't do a 10% reduction for summer. We thought we might capture some full-time equivalent, equivalent students now. But anything that we would add to the summer or that we would add to the fall because of high demand would really have to come out of the spring. Uh, so uh, essentially the pie is not going to get any bigger. The pie is shrinking by 10% in our planning right now. So there's really no way to make up for that. We also of course have uh, some downward pressure in terms of the ability to fill our career education courses if we have to have them on ground because they are impossible to convert and we have to do physical distancing. So we're really uh, being asked by the state to be as productive, in other words, serve as many students as we have in the past. So we're asked, we're asked to do that in our, our workload, but with 10% less funding, in addition with uh, a challenge for career education. Uh, so we have no ability to uh, put out FTE and capture uh, weekly student contact hours or full-time equivalent students uh, without just going further into a budget hole. And Jamie, the staffing levels for faculty really touch on one of the uh, really hard topics that we've talked about and probably inartfully in our communication that I know uh, a lot of understandable discussion about our communication that uh, our focus uh, in budget reductions is on our contractual commitments to our permanent employees. Certainly never an intention to slight those who are not permanent employees, but simply to recognize the truth that our contract employees, we have a commitment to them in the contract and, and reductions uh, by necessity uh, impact those who are not permanent employees more than uh, adjunct faculty and temporary classified. And I think we all do and want to recognize how incredibly difficult that dynamic is. And uh, a recognition that for, for those impacted, the, you're not numbers, we understand that, that this impacts people. So a really, really hard dynamic that's hard to articulate and a couple of questions related to that that go back to bargaining issues, Mario. A couple of different questions that I think the short answer is that there are items that would be bargained. We've talked about early retirement incentives. Uh, faculty voluntarily taking a, a load reduction and uh, pay and step increases, would they be impacted? And Mario, on all those questions, the short answer is that they would be bargained as far as workload, because we do have a contract, contractual commitment that uh, we, we follow our contracts and take that obligation very seriously. That's exactly right. The only other thing I'd say is that right now, um, because of the rapid pace of change, uh, I, I heard this line the other day that um, this week was the longest month that I've ever had or something like that. Uh, we're meeting consistently with um, really every group um, I'm meeting with the, I'm, I think I'm meeting with every vice president two times a week at least. I'm meeting with, uh, at least we have weekly meetings with LRCFT. We have, um, we're meeting often with basically every other group or whenever, whenever there's a request, we'll find time for, for any group really. We're meeting weekly with Chancellor's Cabinet. And so the appropriate conversation uh, for all those compensation condition questions, and there's plenty of them that have been had and there will be going on for the next three to six months here, um, is, is in those collective bargaining discussions that we have with our employee groups. Some technical questions that are the answers I think would be helpful. The difference between a furlough and a layoff. Yeah, so a furlough, um, you're still with us. You have a reduction in pay, 5, 10, 15% or something like that. And you often get one day off or two days off or three days off a month, whatever the, 
the math works out too for that individual agreement that's in place. And a layoff is a full-fledged layoff. It's the 100% of the pay gone, releasing from any uh, obligation the person has to come to work. Um, and so, um, you know, it's my goal to not have those conversations. We've never seen anything like this before, though. This is uh, something that is, um, you know, it would, the first couple weeks this was, this came around, the conversation was, um, even from state policymakers, uh, some of the smartest economic minds when it comes to state revenues was, this is going to be worse than the dot-com boom, but not as bad as the Great Recession, the most recent housing crisis we went through. And very quickly after those conversations came out, it was, well, this is way worse than the Great Recession. We're talking um, uh, Great Depression era kind of numbers when it comes to unemployment, 25, 30% national unemployment numbers. Um, and so, uh, well, I don't want to, you know, nope, I hope to not start any paranoia. I hope to, I don't want to make anybody more stressed out than we already all are right now, but um, we wouldn't be living in reality if we didn't see all those options are on the table. Um, but let's, let's let the numbers work themselves out. Let's let the conversations with the employee groups happen and know that it's the last thing we want to do is to implement any of those difficult decisions. And we're going to do everything we can to mitigate the worst case scenarios, including advocating in the Capitol, uh, both in, in Sacramento and Washington, D.C., for additional funding and uh, recognizing that our commitment to equity is unwavering. And a lot of questions talking about how to balance a commitment to equity. And I think we just have to be honest up front that it makes it harder to, uh, to address our equity values with fewer resources. And when we talk about the commitment to our permanent employees embodied in our contracts, the recognition is that some wonderful people who are in temporary positions are more vulnerable in terms of uh, budget reductions. And we wanna minimize those impacts, but we just wouldn't be telling the truth if we stood up today and said that we can guarantee that, that some of the, the negative consequences are not going to happen because there's so many things that we don't know and uh, Mario, another question probably best answered by you. Will staff be moved around to different departments as uh, a reaction to COVID-19? I'll answer that. I just want to note one other thing. It's not only the equity amongst our students, or amongst our employees, but it's also our students. When we're taking massive cuts to programs titled Student Equity and Achievement, there's going to be real reductions on services we can provide. Uh, this budget does not look exactly like the budgets that we've seen in prior years. But, um, you know, not only do we have to be honest about the discussions when it comes to the employees that will be impacted, but also, you know, um, there's, you know, students from college going cultures aren't always taking advantage of those services that, that have means behind them. Those services are there for our most vulnerable students. And so that's going to have to be a part of that difficult conversation as well. Um, so the Brian's question was, or the question he was pulling from the Q&A was, can employees be moved? The technical answer is yes, and we will follow all contractual rules around that. That's not just a um, COVID issue. That's a, you know, we do that from time to time uh, if there's a, a workload need uh, amongst our four colleges. And that's really, to be honest, one of the great things about our four, our having four colleges is that when things change, we're able to absorb people within the organization to our greatest extent possible. And if there's hardships, we'll work with that employee to, to minimize those hardships as, much, hardships as much as possible. It's taking on a new definition now because um, of the, uh, the hiring freeze and the likelihood that there won't be as many positions uh, in the future as there are today. Um, so uh, we will begin to have conversations about what that looks like. And to be honest, there's also a part of it that's, um, you know, our, in our effort to keep our employees uh, that are, um, uh, it, to, to hold on to our employees, as many of them for as long as possible, uh, we have to be able to use them as much as possible because with less money likely means less services. So if we can take someone who would not be considered uh, eligible to be able to work in their position in a remote environment, we have to be open to the conversation about, well, what could that person do? We have plenty of need. And, and if there's people who we have on payroll, we need to be able to try to find creative ways to ensure that our students are getting the full service for every dollar that we come, that's coming through this district. 
several excellent and difficult questions for programs that rely in entirely or almost exclusively on temporary workers, what will happen? And Mario, I think that's a corollary to your question that the reality is in a remote environment, we will have some employees who will not be able to do the job they normally would do. So it's gonna require incredible flexibility to redeploy full-time employees to keep programs operating. And uh, the funding source matters as well. A good question about federal work study that uh, we certainly wanna use the federal work study dollars. So that, that will be an instance where student workers will continue to be employed. The challenge comes with temporary uh, employees who are funded from the, the general fund and not from other sources like federal work study. And several more questions about the difficulty of protecting our vulnerable populations with less money. And again, the candid uh, observation of reality that uh, we can't do more with less, that the difficult process is prioritizing how we can continue to, to serve our vulnerable students with less money. And, uh, and some of those decisions are not going to be uh, optimal by any stretch of the imagination. And several questions about the difficulty of holding some classes remotely. And I'll turn back to uh, Deputy Chancellor Nye again. The day will come where we will resume face-to-face -face instruction, but the reality is it won't be this summer and it won't be in the fall in substantial numbers. We are developing plans for reopening whenever circumstances allow. Jamie, do you have anything to add about that? Well, we do have a list of all of the courses that are impossible to convert, and it's very similar to the courses that were impossible to convert this term. Uh, we've gone over those uh, this morning with the Vice President of Instruction and the Associate Vice Chancellor of Instruction. So we're very aware of this issue. We're looking at as many creative options as possible. We want to keep term lengths shorter if possible in case there is a disruption. We are contemplating an early start fall for some of those classes on a voluntary basis, uh, but that's uh, one option that we're considering but hasn't been decided yet. Uh, and we are really uh, trying to have as little disruption to students as possible uh, if there is an interruption in the fall. Um, I know there's strong interest for uh, certain courses to be on ground, but really we are almost fully online in the fall. That's the decision we made and we're going to stick to that decision. Uh, a list of the sample types of courses that people just to get a flavor though. I mean, I'm holding a list in front of me from ARC. You have things like automotive, uh, we have, you know, uh, nursing, we have welding, uh, hospitality management. We have a list of those and a lot of career education, so almost exclusively career education, where those are just really impossible to convert. But even with that, we are contemplating having very different program sequences where we don't offer a program as it would have been offered or don't offer courses that can't be converted even though we normally would have offered them and really shift to things that we can offer online. So we're trying to maximize access online. And Mario, one final question before we pivot to the important second part of the town hall today is a question about being a large multi-college district as opposed to if our four colleges were independent. And the question is, which way do you get more money? You've got the uh, deep finance, uh, deep experience from the Department of Finance and the Chancellor's Office. Would we be better off being four independent colleges as far as appropriations than being a large multi-college district? No, definitely not. Uh, so from a technical answer on a per student basis, our funding would increase, but you would have four more of everything. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's, uh, People who have worked as administrators in single colleges generally notice the difference when they go to larger multi-college districts. Um, and so uh, the, there's different there's different workloads. Not that it's easier at a multi-college; they large is us. There's different complexities involved, but um, there's definitely not more money. This, a student's a student; they pay you the same amount. Um, but there are efficiencies that are gained, and the level of expertise 
that you have at a larger multi-college district where you can really take advantage of those economies of scales are there. Um, and so um, that's been my experience working at the chancellor's office and, you know, before the department of finance working with, you know, the vast majority of college leaders throughout the state. So. There certainly are pros and cons to being uh, part of a single college district and a multi-college district serving as a president for nine years at Cabrillo college in a smaller single college district. The, uh, the financial benefits of being a multi-college district are fairly significant as far as leveraging resources. The organizational complexities are real, and uh, I'm just so proud of how people have worked together across the college boundaries to uh, coordinate resources and solve problems. And uh, just wanna again say how appreciative I am of all of the hard work that has gone on in the last two months. It's hard to remember, it was just Friday the 13th, March, Friday the 13th, when we made the decision to transition to remote operations. Hard to even wrap your mind around the fact that three business days later, we went to 100% remote operations, a phenomenal accomplishment that took everyone in our organization, everyone on this call to make possible. So as we look ahead, as hard as the last few months have been, we know that if the budget reductions that Governor Newsom has charged us with uh, move forward and it looks like they will and we hope it doesn't get worse but recognize that the economy could get worse over the summer we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and make really difficult decisions together and do that in a way that uh, minimizes the threat to equity and also mitigates the most negative impact on our employees and we're going to tell the truth to all of our employees about what the reality is and, and help employees uh, who, who are not going to be employed in, in, in the short term to find whatever unemployment benefits and other benefits there may be. We wanna be very supportive of employees who are going to have to go through a difficult transition in the short run. So that is uh, the first part of our presentation today. And uh, we'll get a, a transcript of the Q&A from today. And we'll make sure that the questions we haven't had uh, a chance to, to answer more thoroughly, we will. And also, if you have questions that come up after the, the, the town hall meeting today, we'll find a way to compile answers to frequently asked questions and provide you the best information we can.